So hi everyone who's um, joining us now for the mental health session. So we have a friendly face with us at HDO now, Dr. Bonnie hennig Trussman, uh, who's one of our board members at HDO. And as I mentioned, she will lead this session for us on mental health. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen and I hope you enjoy the session. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Bonnie. I'm coming to you from Roanoke, Virginia, in the United States. My topic is mental health, what's in your toolbox. I'll be breaking down this topic into four different areas. It's for people who are at risk, people deciding to test, living with negative or positive test results, and loving someone with Huntington's disease. What I hope that you're going to see is that there are common themes that run throughout this presentation so all of this information can be used by lots of different people. So let's start. Being at risk. First of all, I think it's really important to know that people who are at risk usually put themselves under the microscope. So they're really seeing a lot of what they think are symptoms of Huntington's disease. It's really important, however, to realize that there are a lot of different reasons why you might be having these, what you call symptoms. It could be stress, lack of sleep, hunger, dehydration, lots of different reasons. And of course, there is that fear of the unknown. So for a lot of people who are at risk, they have anxiety, they might have depression. So let's talk about what can be in that toolkit. It's really important to connect with others and to talk to others who are at risk, as well as people who've been tested, and they can be tested positive or negative, but to find out a little bit more about their experiences. Also, do involve your support system. I hear from so many people who are at risk that they don't want to be a burden on other people and they don't want to upset their family. But what winds up happening is that there's lots of people who are their support systems who don't know that they're going through this or the people in the family are already concerned or worried or fearful about the future. And it's really helpful to have an open conversation with those people, even when you think it's going to be upsetting. People are already upset, but they're doing this on, separately from each other instead of working together and getting support from each other. So that can be really important. Also, practice self-care. That includes lots of things, which you'll hear many times in this presentation. That's about nutrition, good sleep hygiene, exercising, hydrating, which people don't uh, usually think about, something like meditation or just breathing exercises and avoiding toxins in your body, such as alcohol and drugs. It can be also very, very helpful to join a support group or get counseling. And a quick word on this, because I'm going to be talking about this throughout this presentation. If you join a support group, whether that's online or in person, and it's not the right fit for you, it doesn't mean that every support group is going to be the same. It's really important to try to find different types of support groups that fit your needs. So don't just give up because you went to one or you heard from somebody that it wasn't good or that it met their needs in a different way. It's really important to continue to try to find that right support group or even the right counselor for you. So let's move on to deciding to be tested. This is a big decision and I need you to remember that it's your decision. Now, there might be a lot of factors outside of just yourself that impact your decision to test. It might be that you are planning on going to school or have a certain job and you really want to figure out in terms of the future what might be right for you. It might be that you have small children. It might be that you want to start a family. It might be that your children are old enough that they are starting their own relationships and you're thinking maybe it's time for me to test. That's fine. Those are all environmental issues that will impact your decision, but the decision is absolutely yours to make. If you are not comfortable and you don't want to, that's fine. First of all, it's also important to know that we need to make sure that people can give consent, that they are capable of giving consent, uh, that they have the capacity to do that cognitively, as well as being over 18, at least in the United States, that that considers you a legal adult. Now, I'm not talking about, obviously, juvenile onset Huntington's disease. That's a totally different story. But for right now, in terms of adult onset, you do need to be 18 years of, of age in order to be tested so that you can give consent. I do have a lot of people who also come to me and say, how will I know? How will I know when I'm ready? 
And over the 20 plus years of working with people who are in the Huntington's disease community, and for many of those are deciding to be tested or not, what they have told me is that they just have this feeling because every day they're thinking about, am I positive? Am I negative? What, what should I do about the future? So for sometimes, for some reasons, people are doing what I call that dance. They're getting information. They're thinking that they want to get tested. They might get information about a testing center. And then they back off a little bit because they're just not ready. What I'm saying is that internally, a lot of people usually know when it's the right time. So if you're still having that, the, the questions and you're still trying to make the decision, really talk to somebody about that. It can be really helpful. The other thing I hear a lot about is, I don't want counseling. I just want to put my arm out or have a cheek swab, have the blood test, whatever it is. And I understand that there are people who have generations upon generations and lots of people in their family with Huntington's disease. So they understand Huntington's disease. That's fine. That's not what this counseling is about. It's really about being able to use people as a sounding board to say, oh, I haven't thought about that in my decision to test, or have I been able to get my benefits for um, uh, to, make, to make sure that I'm protected in terms of long-term care insurance and life insurance and health, other health insurance. So it's really about going through a checklist with somebody to say, you know, is this the right time for you? So it's not that you have to go into psychotherapy. It's about being able to go through a checklist with somebody to say, have you thought about these things? You're talking about if I'm positive or negative, this is what I'm going to do. Can you do those things anyway? So I think it's really helpful and it's really necessary to go through a testing program that is um, that has people who can help you along that journey. A lot of times other people who are deciding to test just say to me, I know I have the gene. Um, I feel like I look like the parent with Huntington's disease or I act like them or I'm having symptoms again, they're putting themselves under the microscope. And I think it's important to know that that is common. When I ask people, in terms of some of the counseling, uh, what do you think? Do you think that you have this gene or that you don't have this gene? So many people say to me, I think I do. And they'll give the reasons. Again, they know in their minds that it's a 50-50% chance of having this gene. And just because you look like somebody or act like a parent doesn't mean that you have it. But this is also a coping mechanism. And I think that that's really important to know that that's fine. Many people will say, I have the gene, so that if they do get the results back that they are positive, they, they feel like I've known this all the time. If they get result that it's negative, then they're saying, okay, now I'm happy. So this is really common, so, so don't worry about that. So let's talk about the toolkit for deciding to test. I think it is really, really important that you talk to your loved ones prior to starting the testing protocol, prior to, st uh, to starting your testing journey. And it's a question of like, who am I going to tell and how am I going to tell them? What we hear so many times is that people who don't involve loved ones, family, friends, then have this added burden later on where they're trying to say, you know, now I'm positive. When do I tell them I've gone through this? There's no really good time to do that. And it winds up making a burden for you that you're carrying this for sometimes years, as we've heard uh, from people in this Congress, as well as other people that you might know. So it's really important to have that conversation before because it gives the control, it takes the control off of you and it puts the control back on somebody else so that they can make the decision if they don't want to be involved. And it could be a really simple question such as, I'm thinking about testing for HD. This could be a family, friend, loved one, anybody. Do you want to be involved or not? If you do this ahead of time, you will know if that person wants to be involved. And many times people who've said, you know, I don't think that my mother or my sibling or my significant other or my partner wants to be involved, all of a sudden finds out that of course they wanna be involved with you. But again, if they say, no, I don't wanna know, I can't handle this, then you will know that that's not the person that you are going to be uh, relying on or telling this information. As I mentioned briefly, I think really being able to uh, test is also about finding out in terms of benefits. And again, all the knowledge I have is about the United States. So other countries might be different, but I think it's important to at least look into this. So for people in the United States, it's about your health insurance. Do you have health insurance? Can you get more health insurance? Is there something you need to do if you are going to, if you wind up positive? Also life insurance. If you test and you test positive, it might be very difficult or impossible to get added life insurance. 
Long-term care insurance is really important to look into. Short-term and long-term disability. And remember, long-term care insurance is very different than long-term disability. Those are two totally separate things. So talk to a counselor or somebody who knows about this. And again, it's really important to get some counseling and join a support group or look into uh, some, some options in terms of this so that you can find out different people's experiences. And I think it is really important. And most testing centers will say to you that you need to have a support partner. Again, many times people will say to me, I want to do this by myself. And I say to them, I understand that. I understand this is your journey, but I really think it is important that you have a testing partner. It does not have to be a significant another a partner, a spouse, a parent. It needs to be somebody that you trust. And that could be a sibling. That could be um, somebody who's outside of your family. That could be a close friend. That just needs to be somebody that you can walk through this journey with. I think that that's really important. So let's talk a little bit about the result visit. It is really important to bring that testing partner to that result visit, whether it's virtual, whether it's in person. That person can help to be your eyes and ears. Sometimes it is difficult for them to hear this information as well, and they might get emotional. But I think it is really important to make sure that you have identified somebody who can walk with you through this journey, who can handle that emotionally and physically, and is able to be there for you and with you. Know that, especially during the waiting period, it is extremely common to feel anxious and to worry about this. Did I make the right decision? Um, you know, what is the result going to be? What happens if there's a problem with the, the blood test? All of these things are things that people worry about during the waiting time, which could be weeks. It can be really helpful just, just, just to distract yourself. That could be with work or with hobbies. You don't want to just push those emotions away and never think about them, but you also don't want to get overwhelmed every single day to a point that you can't function. So sometimes having a distraction can be really helpful. Also, you might want to reach out to others proactively. And what I mean by this is if you're telling people that you have been you've been tested and you're waiting for the results and you're letting them know when the result date is, what you might want to do is to say to somebody, listen, this is the date that I'm going to have the results. I have a testing partner with me, but what could be helpful is, you know, a day after or that morning or whenever I, I tell you the results, just check in with me. I might not be able to ask you to check in with me once I have these. I don't know how I'm going to react if it's positive or negative, but it's really important to me that you reach out. So here's the script, you know, ask me for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, spend a little time with me. Just check in and text me. Whatever it is, try to give people the script proactively. Uh, you know, is there a, a you know a couple of days that they can spend with you, or you can do something the a uh, couple of days after? And again, practice self care. So again, you'll see this a lot: nutrition, sleep, exercise, hydration. I know it's a, a loop here in terms of this, but you'll see this, and I think it's really important: meditation, breathing, and avoiding alcohol and drugs. And also, please do pre-plan for the result day. So if you are somebody with small children in the house, know by you just going into another room and getting results virtually and then having to walk out and put on a smiling face because you're just not ready to process that is not a good plan. Really make sure that if you do have small children in your home, that you have somebody who can take them for a day or two, that you can have, uh, that you don't have to go back to work perhaps the next day, or maybe if that's a support, that you do go back to work but that you plan that day of what's going to happen and that you do not um, pack that day full of things that you normally would do. Give yourself a little bit of time, whether it is positive or negative results. So let's go in terms of living with the test result if it's negative. Know that people do have survivor's guilt. They have that feeling of I've dodged the bullet. They also feel like, okay, you know, I'm now going to be the caregiver for everyone in my family because I'm negative. Or there was that bargaining that happened in terms of if I'm negative, I'm going to, you know, raise money and awareness for Huntington's disease, or I'm going to take care of everyone, or I'm going to write blogs, or I'm going to get involved in the HD community. Those are all common feelings. And sometimes after people get that result of being negative, that changes for them. So let's talk about that toolkit. Know that those mental health issues are real. A lot of people will say to me, why am I having such a problem when I'm negative? I should be so happy. But no, for all those reasons I just mentioned, the survivor's guilt, that feeling of dodging the bullet, the feeling that you now are the caretaker for everybody who's positive in your family, 
those are all real feelings in terms of feeling overwhelmed and anxious. So again, even if you are negative, it could be really helpful to get some counseling and to talk to other people who are also have been tested negative through a support group. Know your limits. So this again is really important that you give yourself some space just because the feeling was, I'm gonna bargain and if I'm negative, I'm gonna do all these things. Know that sometimes that's not realistic. You need to give yourself a little bit of space and know that you might not be able to be that person who is the caregiver. So know that that is okay and that you need to check in with yourself and say, what's realistic for me to do? Am I going to run away from all of this and not deal with this for, a, 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 for now, for short term or even for long term? Know that that is your limit. Practice self-care. Even if you're negative, nutrition, sleep, exercise, hydration. I know I'm a bro broken record here and that you, of course, see the common theme, but it's really important to do these things. Meditation, breathing, avoiding drugs and alcohol. So when you're living positively with a test result, know, first of all, that everyone's journey is going to be different. Take, it could take years for the, a positive result to actually feel like it's sinking in, which is fine. That is for some people to be expected. Some people are going to be task oriented. They are going to join groups. They're going to look out for a, an HD center. They are going to read everything. They're going to start blogging. They're just going to get just jump into this with two feet. And for other people, they are going to be avoidant. They are just going to run away from from this. And both of those things are, you know, are you are, are how you're going to experience them. Now, if it's overwhelming to be task oriented and to um, to delve into this to a point where this is all you think about, that might be an issue. And if it's an avoidance so much that you are not taking care of yourself or not thinking about this at all, that might be an issue as well. So let's talk about what's in the toolkit for people who have tested positive. First of all, know that your CAG repeat does not mean that you have a diagnosis of HD. So if you have a CAG repeat of let's go from 40, because we know that that's positive, 40 and above, that does not mean that necessarily that you have Huntington's disease. You have had this gene since you were conceived. The information that you got now is that you are positive, but we don't know if that gene has turned on so that it's producing proteins which are going to make symptoms of Huntington's disease happen unless it's blatantly obvious, if you have Korea, if you have some of these other issues that somebody, a, a healthcare practitioner says, yes, I think that you have started symptoms of Huntington's disease. For many people who are, who are asymptomatic, meaning that they don't have symptoms and have had this test and now find out they're positive, that doesn't mean you have Huntington's disease. So it's really important to know that you should, you know, if you are concerned about this, that you should talk to a healthcare practitioner. Again, in terms of now putting yourself under the microscope, now every time you forget a name, every time you might have an outburst or feel sad or anxious, every time that you trip over something, you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, this is the start of, of the symptoms of Huntington's disease. And that does not necessarily be, that is not necessarily true. So it's really important if you're feeling that way to connect with an HD program. I also strongly urge you to have a support person with you and give them access to that healthcare team as well. So complete a release of information so that you have somebody in your family or your friends, somebody close to you, significant other partner who has access to that team as well. So before there's any kind of questions, one of the first things is to complete a release of information. And know that there are for you observational and clinical trials that you might be eligible for, even if you don't have symptoms of Huntington's disease. So that might be something that you want to look into. Educate yourself. There are wonderful resources. I'm going to list some of them. There are so many national advocacy organizations for Huntington's disease, but there are also really good websites. There are also websites that you're going to go down a rabbit hole and it's really hard to, to, to get you out of those. So look for reputable places. One place that I go and I suggest to my, my patients with Huntington's disease and their family and friends is HD Buzz. It's well known and I think it's going to be really helpful to get really good solid information that's easy to understand and comes from really great uh, researchers in the field. Connect. Make sure you connect with people. Reach out and communicate. It's really important to tell your story for two reasons. One, it helps you, and also it helps somebody else. 
So you can say to somebody, here's my story, here's what worked for me, either through my testing process or when I was at risk or how I told people, here's what didn't work for me. So you might wanna consider those things. So you're not only helping yourself, but you might be helping somebody else out as well, who's either at risk or who's tested positive. And again, it's really important to get support. That could be a support group and find the right support group for yourself. Again, practice that self-care. It's the same thing I've mentioned, uh, nutrition, sleep, exercise, hydration. These are all so important things to do. Meditation, breathing, and avoiding alcohol and drugs. Also, don't let HD define you. So many people that I've worked with have said to me, I'm going to walk with this. I'm going to take control and I'm going to be the one making the decisions. When I have a bad day, when I have a day that whether it actually is symptoms of Huntington's disease or not, sometimes I just say I'm having an HD day. I think that that's really important just to be able to say I am not HD. I'm greater than HD. Find structure as well. If you are able to give yourself some structure, whether that's short term or long term, I think that that's really helpful. And when you set those goals, it really helps you to keep focused as well. Now, the goals can change, the structure can change, but each day you're thinking about how can I do this and walk with this and make this better and take control. When you love someone with Huntington's disease, know that caregivers need taken care of as well. It's really important. There is caregiver burden, it re, it's a real thing. It can lead to depression and anxiety. It can actually decrease your immune system and it can increase blood pressure, which leads to all kinds of other physical issues. Know that being a caregiver is a really hard job to do. So many times you're the brunt of a lot of the issues that are happening with that person with Huntington's disease. And many times that person with HD isn't saying, thank you for being there, thank you for taking care of me. So it's really important to recharge your own battery. Self-care is not selfish. We hear so many times if you've been on a plane, one of the first things they do for safety is making sure that you know that you need to put your oxygen mask on first and then you can help others. If you try to help others without helping yourself, they're not gonna be able to survive and you're not gonna be able to survive. So that's really important to make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Also, form a relationship with that HD team. Create a crisis plan, even if you don't think there's going to be any kind of crisis. Is there a release of information? Do you have all the medication that that person needs? Do you know who to contact and reach out to? Do you have a, a phone number for mobile crisis? You know, any of those kinds of things that will help you um, in advance can be really important. Also, let the person with Huntington's disease, your loved one, know that in case there is an issue, in case there is a physical issue or a psychological or emotional issue that's going on with them, that you're going to need to pick up the phone and call the Huntington's disease care team. And say this not as a threat. If you don't calm down, I'm gonna call the team. That's not what this is about. It's about we're having some difficulty here. Everyone's walking on eggshells. This is not okay, and I need to reach out. And also when you do reach out, Try not to say to, to the Huntington's team, don't tell the person that with Huntington's disease that I called, because then it makes it really difficult for us to say, well, how are we supposed to interact with that person? So if you're able to say, listen, we're having a hard time, not sure if it's me, I'm not sure if it's you, but I think it's time to connect with the HD team, that makes it a little bit easier. Get support for yourself. That could be family and friends, the support groups that you have created, the caregiver support groups, whether that's online or in person, the whole HD community can really help in terms of giving you tips and support. And for you, it might be about going to counseling yourself, just so you have a place to talk about some of the frustrations. If you have the energy, talk to the community. That could be educating law enforcement or EMTs, police, anybody to say, if I have an issue with this love, my loved one with Huntington's disease, I want to let you know who they are in advance. I want to let you know, you know, where they go to for their care, what, what we might see happening, and you know, anything that I can give you about awareness and education about Huntington's disease, you might want to do that in your local within your local community. Know your limits as well as other limits. And, this, and I put down, don't guess. What I mean by this is sometimes I have caregivers who say, I just wish their family would have helped. I just wish my brother would help with my mother. I know that that can be really difficult. 
But one of the things is that you could put a lot of energy into being angry at the family, at your family, at your children for not being involved. That takes up a lot of time and energy for you. So one of the things is just to be able to say, okay, I know in advance, this is as much as this person can give. They can't give in anymore for whatever reasons they have. Now, can I take that information and put it aside and focus my energy on what I need to do in order to help my loved one with Huntington's disease? And again, practice some self-care. I've added a couple of other things in terms of even just getting away and reading a book, doing yoga, going for a walk for yourself. And it is really important that you have regular health checkups. So many times I have caregivers come in who have gone through a litany of all this check, these uh, check marks that they have for the person with Huntington's disease from getting flu shots, COVID shots, anything, and then they forget about themselves or they put this off. It is really important to make sure that you have your health checkups as well. Here's a, some more toolkit tips. For that person with Huntington's disease, you might want to, and I know it's difficult, to avoid stressful situations. Stress is going to be there, but if you can just say, do I have to tell that person, my loved one with Huntington's disease, about my whole day and how difficult it's been? Because it's going to be hard for them to hear about that, and they're not going to know how to process it. So can I damp down as much stress as possible? Try to stay calm, and I know that that can be frustrating. Using a gentle voice can be helpful and avoid physical contact. I know it's it's it can be so frustrating at times and you might want to just grab that person and put them over here or just say, you know, you have to come with me, but try to avoid physical contact as much as possible when you're angry. Try not to yell and get upset. Try to remember that this is about Huntington's disease. Also try not to argue or reason with that person with Huntington's disease. It's a, a no-win situation. Even if you are right, it is better just to say, you know, you look like you're upset. I'm sorry you're upset and try to figure out a way that you can distract that person with Huntington's disease. It's also helpful to teach family and friends about Huntington's disease so that they expect behaviors. They might be coming over, you might be going on a vacation with everybody, but to say, this is how he or she is. This is what's helpful. This is what's not helpful. This is what you might see. This is what you might not see. It can be really helpful to give people information about that person with Huntington's disease so they know what to expect in terms of physically as well as their behavior. If you can, try to keep routines and daily schedules as normal as possible. People do better, people with Huntington's disease do better when they know what to expect ahead of time. And have a safety plan in place, even if you've never had an issue or a crisis where this is needed, it is really important to know that you have a list of the healthcare providers on your phone or someplace that you will always have access to it, that you have medication, that you know what phone numbers to call. And if needed, if you are, if there's a heated situation and that person with HD is starting to get out of control, make sure that you leave the room and sometimes you need to leave the house. Let's talk really quickly about depression and anxiety. If you continue, and you being all these people, if you are at risk, deciding to get tested, have tested, or a caregiver, if you continue to feel depressed and anxious, if the depression and anxiety gets worse, or you feel suicidal, it is extremely important to talk to a healthcare professional. It is not a sign of weakness, and it's really important for you to ask for help. So please do know that that can be common, and that you are not alone. A lot of people go through with this. It is really can be very, very difficult. Of course, there's going to be times where you feel anxious or you feel depressed, but I'm talking about times where it gets out of control and you feel suicidal. Even just taking a step back to say, you know, I'm feeling impulsive, I'm feeling really desperate at this point. Can you give yourself just a few moments to be able to say, let me get through this? Sometimes a mantra such as, this too shall pass. Give me, give me five minutes, give me 10 minutes, give me a half an hour. Can I just you know, feel a little bit different in an hour? Is it going to get better? And usually it will be different for you in an hour or so. So it's really important to make sure that you do ask for help. So in summary, it's really important for all of these different, uh, pe the different types of people that I was talking to you about, that you talk to yourself as if you are somebody that you love. If you were somebody else and talking to, giving yourself advice, what would you say to that person? If you talk to yourself and say, if I was you know, my loved one, if I was my best friend, what would, what would I say to them if they were in this situation? Ask for and accept help. 
please do reach out to others. We are here, family, friends, support group, counseling, professionals, HD advocacy organizations. It is really important to reach out. It can really help you. And you'll hear when you do reach out to people how this has helped other people. Practice self-care, of course, nutrition, sleep, exercise, hydration, meditation, breathing. And because it's easy just to say practice self-care, I'm going to give you information about one practice that I use. It's called 54321. You might have heard about it. And it's when you're feeling anxious, sometimes even if I'm in a situation that I know is going to be anxiety provoking, I try to do this ahead of time. So it is really about just taking a second and looking around at five things you can see. Now, it's not just saying, oh, there's a door, there's a plant, there's this. It, it's about, oh, I always look at that door, but now I'm seeing that there are things on that door. There are panels or there is a painting that I'm looking at and there's a certain brush stroke. So you take a second to have five things that you see, four things that you can hear, and you sometimes you need to listen really closely, three things that you can smell, two things that you can touch, and one thing that you can taste. And this is a distraction, but a lot of times in terms of anxiety, when you feel a panic attack coming on, or you know you're going into a situation that you feel anxious, to be able to say, what is a tool in my toolbox that I can use? And sometimes even just after five, all of a sudden the five things you can see, you start to calm down a little bit. So see if this can be helpful. And last, know that there are resources. Of course, you can contact HDO. I think that's really important to know that we are a global organization and it can be really helpful to reach out so that we can connect you to the right people. But also know that there are national HD advocacy organizations all over the world. And I only listed a couple, HDSA, Huntington Society of Canada, HDA, EHA, and there are so many countries that have their own HD advocacy organizations. And remember, a reputable website is hdbuzz.org for some good information. So I do hope that this was helpful to you. It was only a half an hour. I did not go over everything. And it was just a tiny little bit just to know that you have tools in your toolbox. So reach out to us and we are happy to help you. I hope that you enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you. So thank you all so much for joining us for um, Dr. Bonnie um, Hennig Trussman's session. Um, we now have another 15 minute break. We've just gone over by um, a minute or two, but we've now got another break now for 15 minutes, followed by a personal story on JHD from Cheryl Sullivan on track one and a research update from Neurocrine on track two. I think you'll probably all agree, as I can see from chat, that they were really, really useful advice. And I know for myself, I'll take a lot of those tools with me um, when I'm working or when I'm doing, doing anything day to day life, really. I think there are some really good strategies. Um, so remember, there are booths in the exhibition hall. And if you want to speak to somebody or if watching this session has made you think of some different things you'd like to speak to somebody about, please go to our HDO booth in the exhibition hall. Or you can also chat um, in, in the community with the community in the lounge. So if you go into the lounge, there's a number of different groupings, tested negative, tested positive, young people, JHD, for example, and you can chat with um, different people there in the community. Um, so thank you again, and we'll end these sessions, and we'll see you back in around 10 minutes or so. Bye for now.